Imagine a summer when Britain ran out of water. Well, the flow of the Thames has now, in fact, stopped. The perception of England was that it always rained. In 1976, the UK was one of the hottest places on Earth. You never saw a cloud. It was like living in the Mediterranean. Temperatures reaching 36 degrees centigrade, lasting for 10 long weeks. All of a sudden, we were into a parallel universe. And 45 days without a drop of rain. To ask for two solid weeks of rain is like crying for the moon. That's when we started to take it really seriously. Leading to the most devastating drought for 250 years. Water supply to this area will be interrupted between the hours of 12 noon and 7 p.m. I'd taken water for granted all my life. I think it's really dreadful. I mean, it's worse than the war, isn't it? It was, oh my God, this is heat, the like of which we've never known. But as Brits rose to the challenge, I'd never actually bathed with a friend, because I didn't have a friend at the time I fancied enough to have a bath with. For kids, it was a summer that seemed to last forever. And we just played out. I just remember it, yeah, with unalloyed happiness. Were these the most halcyon days in British history? Everyone was stripping off. It was just bliss. Everyone was copping off with absolutely everyone. But when the weather finally broke... Great plopping drops of rain. Ending months of communal standpipes for millions of Brits, society would never be the same again. It made us all watch each other in a kind of Stalinistic way. On the 23rd of June, 1976, a high-pressure system settled to the east of the UK. Hot, humid weather from the Mediterranean started to flow north. And within 24 hours, the country was basking in temperatures over 30 degrees centigrade. I can remember going up the motorway into London, and it was a beautiful day. Uh, the sun was shining, uh, it was a clear blue sky, and I thought, this is great, let's make the most of this. It was golden, it was warm, it was all the things that you never get in this country. Do you know, the, the entire landscape of life in Britain changes when it's nice and bright. People go around and say hello to each other. 1976 was the year that British kids played on space hoppers, rally choppers, and Concorde took off for the first time with paying passengers. Cheery lunch, appetizers of caviar and lobster, champagne, fresh strawberries, and the very best wines. In 76, I was lucky enough to go on one of Concorde's first flights. A slight sensation as the reheat is turned on, then through Mach 1 and onto Mach 2, the muzzle velocity of a rifle bullet. And I actually went supersonic while I was in the toilet. Also about to engage its afterburners and take off into British history was the longest, driest summer for the last three centuries. The furnace lit, and we suddenly went into these uh, scintillating temperatures of 28, 32, all over the uh, south of Britain. That's when we were really broiling. The first big advantage of the early heat wave went to Wimbledon. First of all, it wasn't a washout for the first time ever in living memory. The problem was, it didn't just shine, it burned and frazzled, it fried. People were frying their eggs on the pavement while they were waiting to get into Centre Court. It was certainly the hottest Wimbledon record. Hundreds of people needed treatment for heat exhaustion. Spectators were taking off their shirts. Uh, the umpires, a couple of them dozed off. It was like a ferocious tropical experience. The strawberries were frying. Sue Barker was 20 that summer. She beat Maria Bueno, who was Brazilian, because Maria Bueno wilted in the heat, apparently. And the poor old tennis players really looked as though they were being barbecued as they played. Ball won Wimbledon in that year. Before your very eyes, you could see his beard singeing and burning. The umpires, very stiff up lip, of course, they were allowed for the first time to remove their jackets. And everyone went, <gasps> A 
After decades of prosperity, Brits were facing a new era of austerity. Per tonne, the cost of both English and imported wheat has gone up about 25% in the last year. This was a year of industrial action and a standard rate of tax at 35 pence in the pound. Jim Callaghan's Labour government was trying to run a country that was running out of cash. From the moment he arrived at number 10, the economic clouds lengthened. The government had to borrow billions from the International Monetary Fund and cut state spending. We're at a time where the whole world economy was hit twice by massive oil price increases. Furthermore, the United Kingdom was at war. On the home front. Of the 41 people who have been killed in Northern Ireland in this month, January, 24 have died as a result of sectarian attacks. It was the peak of the troubles. London had suffered 12 IRA bombs in January alone. We spent long evenings around Westminster just waiting for something to happen. Last night's bomb was placed within a few hundred yards of Marble Arch. It went off without warning. And there was great, great anxiety about it. So, for a worried and weary nation, the start of the heat wave in late June came as a welcome relief from tough times. I don't think anyone knew what we were in for. For the first couple of days, we were anxiously waiting for rain, which was obviously inevitable. And then another day went by, and another day went by, and still no cloud, and still no cool and no shade. I've been enjoying every minute of it. What have you been doing? You've been sitting out in the sun? In the park every day. And I, I got home home help, so I'm out all the time, right. making the best of it. It was so hot that on the 25th of June, a lioness fainted at the um, Roberts Brothers Circus in Norwich. Roberta the lioness, she was called. And the elephant's bath water at London Zoo was saved to water all the plants and the gardens. London was ill-prepared for the heat wave. Temperatures on the tube were soaring to 37 degrees centigrade. At that time, I'd travelled around on the underground, and it used to be so hot and sticky. You'd have some man holding on to the, the toggle in front of you with B.O. The sweltering conditions created a perfect storm for the first major incident of the long, hot summer. On my show, there was a Radio 1 bulletin and uh, that said that people were trapped and nobody was geared up for it. At 10.30 a.m. on the 25th of June, the Bakerloo line suffered catastrophic signalling failure between Swiss Cottage and St John's Wood. It was stiflingly hot anyway, and a journey that was meant to take eight minutes took over 90. There was no air conditioning or anything, and people were passing out. This big blonde guy who was stripped to the waist started swinging on the, the leather straps until finally he was able to kick the windows through. People started walking along the track, which I would have thought was quite dangerous. I mean, you don't know if it was electrified or not, but it was a horrific event. Not even an apology, actually, from London Transport. They said, well, you know, nobody went to hospital, nobody died, and so, you know, it's just one of those things. As passengers staggered out into the sunshine, few realised that their experience was just the first in a pattern of heat-induced events that over the following nine weeks would test Brits to their limits. It was like a really horrible, cheap, low-budget horror film, and it was really happening at a seaside near you. By the beginning of July, the long, hot summer of 1976 was just two weeks old, but already starting to break all records. It was, oh my God, this is heat the like of which we've never known. For 15 consecutive days, temperatures across the country reached at least 32.2 degrees centigrade, peaking at 35.9 on the 3rd of July in Cheltenham. 
Everyone was sort of stripping off and the men were all walking with no shirts on in the street and it was just bliss. I loved it. I loved every single moment of it. I was jet skiing, I was water skiing. It was just absolutely amazing. Every day it was sunny. Every day there was a blue sky and you never saw a cloud. It was like living in the Mediterranean. The parks were full, the swimming pools were full, people were having barbecues, beaches were packed. I can remember I did a Daily Mirror commercial on the beach and we had trouble to find a piece of sand that we could film on because it was absolutely full of bodies, all frying in the sunshine. That summer, the advertising industry pulled out all the stops. Glamorous sun cream ads promised the perfect tan. on your side. Now you can stay in the sun longer because Ombre Solaire has a special new filter to help protect and moisturize your skin for a deeper tan than ever before. But the harsh reality for bronze-crazy Brits was a very different story. Sunburn was obligatory. You wanted to burn. I did laugh because you'd go down the pub and see these men with complete T-shirts on of burnt arms, burnt necks. And the peeling nose, the burning cheeks, the burning shoulders, peeling skin, flaking off all over the place. That's what we wanted, we aspired to that. I used to actually put baby oil on, so I'd just sit there and fry. If we wore sun cream at all, it'd be factor two or factor four. Now it's factor 50, splash it on all over, you know. It was just fun, halcyon days where people just enjoyed themselves and it was great to be able to plan. You think, right, next weekend we can all go to the park and, and, and have a picnic or we can all go to the zoo. You know, you could go down to the Radio 1 roadshows, which were massive in those days. We're off to Newquay very, very shortly. In fact, in three and three-quarter minutes' time to join Noel Edmonds for the Radio 1 roadshow. The amazing weather attracted bumper crowds to Radio 1 roadshows. Today from the North Thistral Beach, Newquay, with... This is the, the one roadshow this year I've really been looking forward to, because everybody says just how fantastic Newquay is. You know, you'd get crowds and crowds of people on, like, Bournemouth Beach, and you'd have, like, Dave Lee Travers. Right, coming up to nine minutes before 12 o'clock on 247 National Radio 1. Noel Edmonds, uh, you know, they were the biggest celebrities of those days. That summer, a new craze, probably helped by catchy adverts, invaded suburban gardens across the country. Swing ball from Dunlop, a great ball game that's swinging everywhere. Play it to win, play it for fun. For any time, for anyone. Everyone swing ball. And if families couldn't afford a tennis ball on a string attached to a stick, kids were simply expected to make their own fun in the sun. We just played out, we played sports, we were playing football, tennis, cricket. So I just remember it, yeah, with unalloyed happiness, really. We had no mobiles. I mean, I was considered a person of disappearance regularly by my mother every 24 hours because she could never find me. I remember my West Indian friends talking about the fact that this is not the London they had come to. This was unexpectedly hot. I was a drama student. We were at the Hippodrome Theatre and it was hot. I was dressing the whole of the cast of Dad's Army. Ian Lavender was so hot, he would be in his underpants till five minutes before he was due on stage. I remember chasing him through the corridors, telling him he has got to get these thick flannel trousers on now. When it came to the less savoury side effects of living with the heat, this was the era of products boasted they could stop us sweating altogether. Now, New Sure gives you a promise of confidence no other antiperspirant can beat. Sure has an unbeatable new formula that helps keep you dry, even here. New Extra Dry Sure won't let you down. But in the early midst of Britain's longest ever heat wave, we needed a better solution. Air conditioning was almost born 
in that era. In the centre of London, near the clamour of congested traffic in Trafalgar Square, lies the cool, comfortable office of the Air Conditioning Advisory Bureau. People had to go to work in suits. Uh, they went into an office, no air conditioning. The main air conditioning was in the cinema or in restaurants. An underground bar and bistro in the heart of an industrial city. A situation to test any air conditioning. Smoke and kitchen smells whisked away. I read about a Debenhams department store in Southampton that was the only institution in the city that had an air conditioning unit. They realised running it for one day during this summer cost them their entire month's budget, £2,500. They never turned it on again. Nothing had been seen like this since records began. What on earth was going on with the British summer? We always look towards the summertime as being intense high pressure coming in from the Azores, a nice finger coming up towards the UK and introducing fine, subtle weather for at least a week or two. But in 76, the traditional Azores high was here to stay, thanks to the jet stream blocking in the mid-Atlantic. It was particularly stubborn that year. It was allowing the hotter air to come further north, helping to intensify the high pressure with new areas of hot weather coming up from the south. Well, I think that um, it's going to stay mo mostly settled. Generally speaking, stable. Uh, temperatures may drop down to the mid-80s. Those days of weather forecasting were based on observations coming from radio sons, balloons being sent up into the atmosphere. The need to know about winds, temperatures and humidities in the upper air makes the weathermen dependent on this large hydrogen-filled balloon, which will be stable and steady in flight and relatively simple and cheap to operate. These weather balloons regularly reach heights of 27,000 metres. That's about 15 miles. It was a question of getting the observations down onto a chart, plotting the chart, drawing your isobars, lines of equal pressure, and working out where the highs and the lows were. It was very much uh, pre-computer. Meticulously, the forecast sheets are penciled in. Which means that you could forecast about two or three days at best. Hello, Shanghai. Yes, Shanghai. Yes, are you the supervisor? Yes. In 1976, there were no weather apps for the latest forecast. The closest thing we had to the internet was a telephone exchange. Today, an extraordinary range of information is available by just picking up the telephone. And I'm standing now in what is, in effect, the nerve centre from which all this information is dispensed. Yet, only half of the UK population had a landline. The average house price was under £13,000, a weekly wage, £72, and a pint of beer would set you back 25 pence. To stand outside in the street drinking your pint of beer, uh, which these days we take completely for granted, in those days didn't happen until that summer. That's really when it started. I think the only thing that put me to sleep was those three pints of beer in the pub every evening, because you just had to keep replenishing. There was a casualty doctor at Charing Cross Hospital in London and he said that everybody should drink a pint of beer and eat a packet of crisps to replace the salt and the fluid that they were losing through the heat. It's the peak of the holiday season. Because of the hot weather, sales of some drinks are up by 30%. A newfangled chilled beer was rapidly swallowing up 20% of the UK market. Suddenly, people were drinking lager because it was advertised on the telly every 10 seconds, and you kept seeing the advert and thinking, oh, lager, marvellous. Three pints of skull, please. Sorry, we don't sell skull here. The lager of the moment may have boasted a Scandinavian-inspired name, but it was actually a brand developed in central Scotland. Clear, golden, beautiful head. And that flavour. Uh, and skull drinking. It's the taste that makes you do it. There wasn't the kind of convenience culture then that there is now. Uh, so we think we take ice, for instance, we take it from completely for granted. You go into a pub now and ask for a gin and tonic and you expect it to be kind of filled up with ice. And in those days, if you were lucky, you might get one cube of ice. Suddenly, people were asking for six cubes of ice. There was no ice dispensers back then. The extraordinary thing about this time is no one ever drank water. A glass of water was looked on like something that had come out of your bath. We only ever drank squash. 
we always had a jug full of tap water on the table, which meant that any other drink at all was just impossibly attractive and exotic. As the summer heated up, I just drank more and more Coca-Cola, or more and more Tab, more and more Fanta. They were very often just warm, just handed to you off a shelf. News agents didn't have fridges. One was a kind of Fanta drink that had a polar bear on the front of the glass bottle, and it furred your tongue up as you drank it. In the 70s, soft drinks were marketed for their sugary rush properties to almost hallucinogenic proportions. Hi, man. This is Cresta's new flavor, black currant. I wonder what. <laughs> <laughs> These drinks actually changed the texture of the skin in our mouth. They were that weird. Nobody thought twice about drinking fizzy drinks, nor did we know about the dangers that you were doing to your teeth and also in terms of obesity. But as Brits did everything possible to stay hydrated, keeping cool on the roads was becoming almost impossible. There were reports of the M1 buckling and cracking, the tarmac melting. Everybody wanted to get to the coast, so there were lots of jams. Fridays, the prelude to a weekend, saw more cars on Britain's roads than ever before, an estimated 8 million. The RAC described the exodus as the biggest motoring bonanza ever. Small consolation for those trapped in 17-mile tailbacks. Cars were just not coping. Cars were overheating, you continuously had to check the radiators, and of course, as you opened the radiator cap, water would shoot out. The Burns Unit at Birmingham Accident Hospital reported more than 20 cases of motorists scalding themselves by removing radiator caps. Most cars didn't have air conditioning in those days. A lot of the seats were plastic. Kids were uncomfortable and getting very fed up with the journey. Actually, your buttocks would be sticking to the plastic seat covers and you'd be sort of just easing a buttock off. There'd be a kind of noise, a kind of horribly sucky noise of your buttock kind of, you know, departing contact with the plastic. Mum was smoking, Dad was smoking, and the smell of the cigarette smoke mingled with the smell of Mother's perfume uh, and the sweat on the back seat. I remember most of my journeys in cars back then ended with me vomiting in the lay-by. As temperatures rose, looking cool was as important as staying cool. People wore almost no clothes at all because it was too hot to wear anymore. Suddenly, a kind of latent hormonal libidinousness that had been suppressed by the weather was unleashed, and absolutely everyone was copping off with absolutely everyone, which really suited me because I was 14 and my hormones had never been more turbulent. I've often heard the 1970s described as the decade that fashion forgot. I was certainly wearing flared trousers, which I actually rather liked, but when you look back on it, it does look rather funny. Everything was flared, which in a heat wave wasn't such a bad thing, actually, because it allowed room for a bit of air up your trouser leg. We had platform shoes. Foreign and British buyers are very interested in the latest trends. Like this flat sole supernatural. Every dinner time, we play football in our platform shoes, and the potential for breaking an ankle must have been incredible. But the good times of the first six weeks of the long, hot summer of 76 were about to come to an end. A cooler snap was on the way, but it wouldn't be bringing rain, and Britain was about to run out of water. None of us had ever known anything like it, and my grandma, Sybil, said, this is the end of the world. Just as Brits thought they couldn't handle the heat any longer, temperatures returned to average. A blessed relief from the hottest four weeks experienced since records began. There was no doubt about it. It did go a little bit cooler for a time, and you wouldn't believe it, a frost was actually recorded. Unbelievable, really, but that's because it was so dry, so any of the heat that was in the ground immediately was lost to the atmosphere. But the cooler temperatures had failed to relieve the dry conditions. 
By now, rain hadn't fallen in parts of southwest England for 45 days. I mean, the Brits love the weather. We just love talking about the weather. And it got to a stage when people didn't start talking about the weather so much, except when is it going to rain? By the beginning of August, Met Office bosses were predicting that Brits would be living with a desiccated landscape for the long term. The latter part of the uh, month of August, I'm afraid, is again likely to be warmish and dryish. So I suppose we'll have to look to September for some sort of uh, relief for this drought situation. Then, as if to add insult to injury, the heat wave was suddenly back with a vengeance. It wasn't long into August before the, the dome of uh, very hot air returned again up from the south. So again, to see temperatures back up at 32 degrees was really unusual. All of a sudden, we were into a parallel universe. None of us had ever known anything like it, and my grandma Sybil said, this is the end of the world. The country was beginning to experience strange, never-seen-before phenomena. From Burnham-on-Sea to Western Supermare, everything and everyone on and around the beaches were under attack from giant swarms of tiny ladybirds. You saw these people walking along the beachfront and suddenly, flum, an enormous plague of ladybirds landed. All I'm trying to do is get down to the beach. Had to pack it in, I think. Never had anything like this before. It was like a really horrible, cheap, low-budget horror film, and it was really happening at a seaside near you. Flowers and crops had matured prematurely, causing a huge early boom in plant-eating aphids. But when the prolonged heat wave killed off the vegetation, the aphids were wiped out. Ladybirds eat aphids, so there was nothing for them to eat, so they swarmed uh, and headed for the towns, villages and cities looking for food. Uh, and it was estimated there was 24 billion. They were going up the windows in our bedrooms. They were on the walls. They were in the flowers. They were everywhere. They were getting in your clothes. I never knew until this point, ladybirds nip you. They're really, really painful. Even more upsetting at the time were the findings of an expert who was studying the swarms using houseplants as bait to catch them. 22. Why did he think the bugs were so busy biting everyone? They're only digging in with their little jaws. Um, hoping to get a little food. They're <laughs> eating you, that's what they're doing. Well, look at them. Shan't be coming down here again, shall we? These birds ain't no ladies. <laughs> <laughs> the ladybird plague was merely an early indicator of an impending crisis. What was going on in the countryside? And why were we running out of water? What we tend to forget is that the previous summer had been warm and dry, which is why the drought conditions got so terrible, because it wasn't just on the back of a few weeks, it was over a year's dry weather. The perception of England was that it always rained. So this idea of a drought was unknown, and people took a long time to really comprehend what this meant. I remember going on planes and looking down, and instead of green squares of fields, it was all brown, and I was quite a shock. Rivers and waterways were the first to dry up. Nowhere were conditions worse than in the West Country and in Wales. Here, the traditionally green valleys took on a new range of tints as the rivers dwindled to a trickle. In the depleted waterways, fish died on a huge scale as oxygen levels fell as fast as nitrate levels rose. The fish being caught in this net would be an angler's delight, but here they are simply rescuing thousands upon thousands of fish. These roach and bream are being taken to the seven Trent Water Authority stock ponds, and there they will stay until there has been enough rain to make it safe to return them. With no river water to fill reservoirs, levels quickly plummeted to alarming lows. Well, you can imagine when you've got the hot sunshine burning through every day, there's an awful lot of evaporation. It, uh, it really does go very quickly. 
during the last fortnight, during this last heavy hot spell, uh, the reservoirs have been depleting at the rate of about 5% of storage a week. It was reported that one reservoir in Bristol was losing 6 million gallons a day. This is Cumtulary Reservoir, and in fact, where I'm standing now at this time of year, I should be well under water. But this reservoir, like the others in the area, is just a puddle. It's when you started to see hidden villages starting to emerge from the water. That's when we started to take it really seriously, I think. What they really need in this area to solve the problem is two good weeks of strong, solid rain, but even in the hills of Wales, to ask for two solid weeks of rain at this time of year is like crying for the moon. The drought was now officially a national emergency. Belatedly, the government mounted a stringent economy campaign. On the 5th of August, a drought bill was hurried through Parliament. The ten water authorities in England and Wales at that time issued 139 drought orders. That was them trying to get a grip, and um, they did what they could. They brought in hosepipe bands. If you live in Wessex, where they're exper experiencing the worst drought for 150 years, you really can be taken to court if they catch you using a hosepipe and fined up to £20. There were hosepipe detector vans driving around the neighbourhoods in those days, and neighbours were very much encouraged to grass, no pun intended, on people who were watering their gardens. You felt that you were letting your neighbours and the whole nation down if you were using too much water. With thirsty gardens capable of swallowing up 1,200 litres of water per hour, it was estimated that the hosepipe ban was saving the Bristol area a million gallons of water a day. But this spelt disaster for the green-fingered community. Our garden was a bomb site, bloody awful. Our grandparents' rose bushes were dying off, their apple trees were dying off. Then my garden in Birmingham was turning brown. We've got a garden and we've saved every drop for our garden, but uh, whether people will waste more than save, I, don't, I really don't know. There were people going out right in the middle of the night with their hose watering the garden and <laughs> desperately not letting their neighbours know they were doing it. It made us all watch each other in a kind of Stalinistic way. And that's a little bit sad. It actually divided our community. It made us distrust each other. This is the Bath Corporation Waterworks Department. The water supply to this area will be interrupted between the hours of 12 noon and 7 p.m. There were restraints on domestic water use and in some cases, a necessary shift to the use of standpipes. Communal taps, known as standpipes, started to replace the mains water supply across thousands of homes in Yorkshire and East Anglia. A man would come down the street with a big, huge, screwy thing, lift up something in the road and just turn the mains off. How do you feel about having your water cut off for eight hours at a stretch? Well, it's going to be a little difficult, isn't it? What sort of difficulties is it going to cause? Well, I have two children of 19 months, and uh, there's all their nappies to wash and all their clothes. Eventually, we had to collect water in the street at certain times. We had to fill buckets, we had to fill any containers we had. We were even filling jugs. And it was, you know, what life is probably like in certain parts of the world all the time. 1976 underlined the truth of the old aphorism. Water wherever it's found, is a prime essential of our lives. I'd taken water for granted all my life. It never occurred to me how precious water was until this year. I think it's really dreadful. I mean, it's worse than the war, isn't it? They've withdrawn their services. I'll withdraw my payment for the time that they do it. <laughs> Thank you very That's much what I intend to do anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do remember the government starting to get serious about um, water rationing and putting bricks in your system, in your toilet and stuff like that. This is all right, but with some, particularly the modern slimline systems, it's rather difficult to get a brick in. And so we've got this idea, which is just an ordinary polythene bag filled with water, tie at the top and just put it in the system. 
With toilets responsible for 30 to 40% of household water consumption, there were also simpler solutions to hand. It probably became the norm to flush it once in the morning and once in the evening. I can't vouch for every family, but that's the way I would have gone on, I'm sure. In the 70s, hygiene standards were almost unrecognisable to today's. The habit of showering every day and bathing every day was not the custom of very large numbers of people in Britain. However, of course, everybody who worked in heavy industry had daily showers at work. The chief of a chamber of commerce in South Wales turned around and said, uh, well, would you rather have a job or a bath? Because people who are having baths were affecting industry. Big factories were going to have to close down or halve their water usage. But there is talk, certainly in South Wales and in other areas, of perhaps a four-day or even a three-day working week. Do you think that's likely? Well, I hope we're some way from that yet. But we mustn't underestimate the seriousness of the situation. But in serious situations, Brits always embrace a blitz spirit. Citizens were urged to fill baths to no more than 12 centimetres and share the water with friends and family. I had never actually bathed with a friend. I didn't have a friend at the time I fancied enough to have a bath with. Well, my family just weren't that close. So we just used to hop into the bath one after the other and no one wanted to go into it after my brother. the drought was having a devastating impact on farming. So many farms, certainly in those days, depended on wells for their water supply. And they were drying up like mad. Uh, water was being shipped in tankers uh, to farms because otherwise they wouldn't have anything for their animals. In the Midlands, sheep now graze fields that should be the diet of dairy cows. The sheep are now cleaning up the pastures that have been burnt off by the sun. The beef animals were really thin, and the dairy industry, well, the cows were not producing enough milk because they were not getting enough food. 100 million gallons of milk were lost, the cattle were being slaughtered. It was, it was really catastrophic. But that summer, much of the nation, and Radio 1 roadshow audiences in particular, seemed oblivious to the farming crisis, all thanks to a novelty act from the West Country. The Wurzels had just had their number one hit about, I've got a brand new combine harvester, which was rather ironic, really, because there wasn't all that much to harvest that year. In East Anglia, the topsoil dried out so much that it turned to dust and started to blow away. Cereals had a terrible year. We had to import an extra million tonnes of wheat. Not a year that the farming industry would like to remember. With 500 million pounds of failed crops and food prices rising by 12%, Agriculture Minister Fred Peart came under severe pressure. What are you going to do about it? To try and help the farmer and try and help these well, but this uh, shortages? Is, this is the nature of uh, the industry. Uh, I'm not a, a rain god. Uh, if I was, I would uh, bring rain for them. That's the answer. That's what they want. Without rain, the potato crop is down by 50%. The potatoes are small. Many have gone to seed. The farmer, Nigel Rush, was anxious to prove this, this to the minister. This is the average size potato we're getting this year. That's a, that's a big potato for this year. For this year. Last year, this year. Look up, sir. They dropped from something like 13p a pound to about 8p a pound, which became, economically, became unviable for the farmers even to lift their potatoes. Because of the drought, the brewer's raw materials are in short supply. 19 million gallons of water are used each year by this brewery in Kent. And then, of course, beer began to run out. And when beer runs out, you know that this isn't a fun thing. This is something very, very serious. This year, the barley price is high. The brewery's farm claim to have the finest hop garden in the world. But nationally, the crop is down by 30%, not enough for next year. Britain was losing the battle of the drought the last two weeks of August would bring more desperate measures, madcap schemes, and even opportunities to make a fast buck. Ice cream vendors were cheating children by giving them smaller dollops of ice cream.
by mid-August 1976, Britain had been baking in Mediterranean weather for more than eight weeks. What about the atmosphere of being abroad on holiday, though? Aren't you missing that? I don't think we are. The children are as happy here as they would be abroad. And we're enjoying ourselves. Well, what better atmosphere? 1976 was the only year that I can ever remember where if somebody else had booked a package tour to Mallorca, you felt contempt. Ha! What a waste of money! Look at the sun, you fool! You dimwit! With Brits enjoying a spectacular holiday season on the home front, a summer business boom was on the cards. Catering receipts up by 23%. Uh, Ice cream over the last three weeks up 100%. Soft drinks up 100%. Absolutely phenomenal. Ice cream salesmen really made a fortune that year. There was always an ice cream van, seemed to be parked in every single road. Didn't even hear the bell because they were just constantly parked there. And of course, people were taking advantage all over the place. The Labour MP for Cannock, Willem Roberts, complained that ice cream vendors were cheating children by giving them smaller dollops of ice cream. A can of pop, as we used to call it in those days, cost 15p, but during the heat wave, there were people selling them for a pound each, which was just unbelievable, and people were buying it. As Brits continued to suffer in the heat, there was still no sign of the end to the drought. This wonderful weather we've got here, which you and I are enjoying now, is really our worst enemy. If only it was damn more rain, we should be fine. Waterboard bosses were being urged to think out of the box. You can put, put rockets on Mars and send men to the moon, surely they can turn seawater into drinking water. There's still a lot of water around in Britain to drink, if you can purify it. Well, here on the River Avon, the Wessex Water Authority are doing just that. All the scum is forced up to the top by these little air bubbles, and you can see them coming up rather as they do when you take the top off a bottle of lemonade. And that forces the scum up to the top, so it ends up like that. Scum on the top, clean water underneath. Anybody who expressed some doubt about that being a good idea was firmly told that it didn't smell. Less than one hour after coming in from the river, it's drinkable. A series of increasingly madcap schemes were in the pipeline. First up, cloud seeding. You could fly an aircraft into a cloud with silver iodide crystals being thrown out, and that would actually act as a nuclei for moisture to form on, and then eventually that would produce rainfall but it would cost an awful lot of money if we were to do it on a regular basis, and I don't think it would have worked anyway for too long. Some ideas were truly gravity-defying. People were very resourceful, but also pretty crackers. <laughs> the flow of the River Ouse was reversed because they dammed it up and made it flow backwards. Operation Rodeo involved damming the river in the fens and pumping 30 million gallons of water 30 miles back over seven locks from Ely to the Midlands. I'll come back again. And when it came to finding new water sources, there was no shortage of willing volunteers. Well, it isn't mumbo-jumbo. I've been doing this dividing this lot 40 years, and I can guarantee that where I have water divine, you'll find water. There. But if water divining didn't work, there was always divine intervention. Villiers Road, Southall, was the setting chosen for this attempt to transport the Guru's rain-producing efforts from the Punjab to Britain. There were suggestions about, you know, should we have some sort of semi-spiritual way to get us a little wetter than we were in the drought. I asked him, with the Guru's help, what are the chances of rain? I would say that the success of the rain occurring is 80%. Uh, People were doing anything they could, even rain dances. It was probably a joke, but I took it literally. And I remember going out into the garden 
and doing a rain dance and just impersonating what I'd seen on a cowboy film. You know, totally culturally inappropriate. But I was just going around kind of howling like a wolf, trying to evoke rain. Dubious attempts to encourage rain mirrored our awkward movements to 1976's summer soundtrack of positive pop. It was a lovely time for very jolly, kind of innocent type, poppy, beachy kind of music. And it kind of went with the weather. They were writing songs that felt good. We won the Eurovision Song Contest. It was when uh, the rest of Europe loved us. The United Kingdom won. Uh, we had Brotherhood of Man, Save Your Kisses for Me. Not a great song then and not a great song now. If they call it Save All Your Bathwater For Me, then it might have played well that summer, I suppose. Another historical competition and the hope of a second great British victory guaranteed a distraction from the drought. And there was the cricket and the West Indies came over. They were an incredibly formidable team. Hardened to playing in tropical heat and on fast outfields baked by the sun, the Windies were in confident form. The England captain was a man called Tony Gregg. And cricketers and sportsmen are always asked to make predictions about what's going to happen. I'm not really quite sure that they're as good as everyone thinks they are. If they're down, they grovel. And I intend to make them grovel. And the problem was with that word, grovel, being used by a white South African, although he was England captain, in the age when apartheid was a growing concern. It only infused the West Indies with a determination to make sure that they did well against Mr. Groveling Greg. The West Indies were further fired up by the raucous support of almost half a million Caribbeans who had emigrated to the UK since 1948. When they played cricket at Lords or the Oval, it is a kind of mecca for West Indians who have come to this country. After drawing the first two tests in June and then losing the next two in July, the England team were rattled. My personal view on it is that I'd like to see perhaps just a little bit less noise, a little bit of consideration. And fired up by Mr. Gregg's rhetoric, they were there shouting and screaming, and with every fall of an England wicket, Lords just exploded in a thunder of sound and joy. The West Indies went on to win the series 3-0. Tony Gregg, I think to his credit, ended up eating humble pie and, and literally, I think, crawled off the pitch to show that it was him grovelling and not the West Indies, but they absolutely wiped the floor with us in incredible heat. That summer, it wasn't just the England cricket team that crumbled and then cracked in the heat wave. From a distance, the Friars Way estate is a model of its kind. Closer up, though, it's apparent that all is not well. After only three years, walls are collapsing and large cracks are commonplace. One of the most surprising problems to come out of the drought was it also created subsidence in a way I have never seen in any other decade. When I was wiping the windowsill off, it just collapsed underneath my hand. As I went along, I had to stop there. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. On buildings and houses, cracks started to appear, especially those built on clay. The soil was drying up and the buildings had never been intended uh, to have to deal with that kind of situation in their foundations. The cost of repairs in Dover alone could run into hundreds of thousands of pounds and create an important precedent to be followed by council tenants facing similar problems elsewhere. So that was a big problem. It cost millions and millions of pounds in restoration work. But worries about cracks in walls would soon pale into insignificance. The fires were bursting out all over, heathland, moorland, and forests and woods. As the nation began to count the environmental and human costs of the driest summer in British history. Kids were jumping into rivers and they were dying.
as Britain entered the last two weeks of August 1976, there was still no end in sight to the driest summer since records began. Forest fires were being reported from Scotland to the Channel Islands. Fires were bursting out all over. Heathland, moorland, and forests and woods. The fire brigade couldn't control them because there was no water <laughs> to, to dampen the fires. So you wouldn't believe how difficult it has been. The pressures all day and all night. We haven't had time to get back for meals or rest, recreation, or anything. On the 19th of August, the Forestry Commission disclosed that fires had destroyed about 1,000 acres of plantations valued at £500,000. Many forests were closed to the public until the end of the drought. Everything was uh, tinder dry. And of course, some people would stupidly smoke and then throw the stub end away, and it was still alight. It was a real problem. If someone came along and lit a pipe at the moment and threw away a match, it's quite possible that the fire would start up immediately, that the match hit the ground. There were forest fires, the kind now that we're used to seeing on our television screens happening in California and Australia, wildfires, basically, and they were a daily occurrence. This is how dry things are. And we spread with very rapidly through, through a forest area. In fact, some people are absolutely staggered by the speed of travel of fires in this situation. Perhaps the worst day was on the 22nd of August, when conflagrations destroyed 200,000 trees in South Wales. The Hampshire Fire Brigade found itself fighting more than 160 individual fires. And in Dorset, 346 elderly patients became trapped. There was one old people's home in the path of a fire. They had to be very quickly evacuated because the fire was advancing. 30 miles per hour. These were problems on a scale that we hadn't really experienced before. It would take decades for all of our natural habitats to recover, but the prolonged heat wave was having an immediate and devastating impact on people's health. In 1976, none of us were that aware of the effect on the elderly, and they were dying. Very old people who particularly have controlled heart disease, but as soon as they get exposed to these high environmental temperatures, then of course they do uh, have severe risk of going into heart failure. Doctors are always telling us, though, that uh, this thing is bad for us or that thing is bad enough. Now you're complaining about the heat. Do you really expect to be taken seriously? Well, I think uh, most old people will probably take very little notice of what we're saying. The Cardiff doctor suggested this morning that um, the very strong sun could be dangerous to old people and it could give them heart attacks. Oh, I does not I look at I'm nearly 80. It's never been, never been dangerous for me. <laughs> that summer saw dozens of British families devastated by accidents and tragedies. There was a weekend at the end of June where 15 people died from drowning. Most of the children swimming in reservoirs and lakes and rivers not aware of the dangers. Well, for children in 1976, there were a lot of government warning films being put out on the TV, and some of them, some of them, I remember one with a grim reaper in it. It was absolutely terrifying. This branch is weak, rotten. It'll never take his way. Only a fool would ignore this. But there's one born every minute. Under the water, there are traps, old cars, bedsteads, weeds, hidden depths. It's the perfect place for an accident. But I think when you're a child and you're very hot, you know, even though you've seen those films, you think, oh, that's just grown-ups being extra careful. And, and kids were jumping into rivers and they were dying. Drastic times would call for drastic measures. It was time for the government to step up and come to the rescue. The solution was simple. They appointed a minister of drought. His name was Dennis Howell, and it was all down to him. He was somehow going to make it rain. On the 24th of August, the Labour government's minister of sport found himself promoted overnight from the subs bench.
Why has the Minister of Sport been made a Minister of the Drought? Well, I think you better ask the Prime Minister, but maybe because there's not going to be much sport played. So he was going to make it sportily rain and rainily sport. This poor guy, how was he going to make it rain? It was a job that I certainly wouldn't have envied. Howell was walking into a perfect storm. There was quite a problem with the, the Thames. There was just a trickle of water coming down it. And that water actually was sewerage. It was quite horrible. Now the responsibility to solve the multiple crises across the nation rested upon his shoulders alone. Minister, you said that the Thames as a great river has now stopped. What did you mean by that? Well, the flow of the Thames has now, in fact, stopped. The uh, Thames is leaking because of the subsoil being so dry, it's sucking water through the bed of the river. Watching that back um, reminds me, you know, just how serious it was and, 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 and how seriously we took it. You talk about a loss of 15 million gallons a day. That sounds extremely serious. Does it mean that the Thames is in danger of drying up altogether? Uh, we hope not, but it is serious. You're quite right. The consumers in the Thames water area use 1,000 million gallons a day at peak periods. We've got to get that usage down to 500,000 gallons a day. There's a very sort of menacing almost side to it that if you don't, we're going to be in deep, deep trouble. The minister was given a portfolio of emergency powers. On the second day of his appointment, Howell set up a national drought helpline. It's certainly not a gimmick, no. It's, I mean, the whole nation's got to take it, uh, the matter very seriously. The six hotlines in London were manned by civil servants offering citizens advice and information. You want a copy of the regulations from the Thames Water Authority? You are, are you in Thames area? Good. Well, I'll see that they get in touch with you later in the day. But I think it was more really to make sure that people didn't go against the hosepipe ban and were there other ways that we, that we could save water. You want to know whether it's uh, whether you're allowed by law to pump water out of a river running through your garden? Um, well, I'm afraid the position is that uh, you're not. The minister's message of water austerity was clear. Hotels must reduce consumption by 25%. If they don't, like everyone else, they've been warned they could be cut off. Now dubbed the nation's drought supremo by the Sun newspaper, on the 26th of August, Howell embarked on a whistle-stop tour of the country's worst-hit areas. He spent every day visiting five or six places affected by the drought. Could you just see it from the top? Just then, see it from the top, yes. Good idea. Trying to ensure that he had people's understanding in what they were being asked to do. Then, on the 27th, just three whirlwind days after Howell's appointment, a strange apparition appeared in the skies above London. I was driving up the M4 motorway, and for the first time in weeks, I saw a cloud. It was a very small little cloud. And it just remained there. I did my radio show. I came out, and there wasn't just one cloud. There were quite a few clouds there. Could a traditionally wet August bank holiday be on the cards? For the first time since June, there were rumbles, there were clouds, there were actual big, fat drops of rain. Somebody said, there's rain on the windows. And actually, I went down two, three flights and went outside. And great, plopping drops of rain on the terraces of the House of Commons. In my mind's ear, I can hear cheering, background cheering noise. <laughs> People went out with their mouths open, it's raining, oh my God, Dennis Howe. Thank you, Dennis, thank you. The Minister of Drought had pulled off an unlikely miracle for both the government and the nation. Arguably, he was the most successful British politician, perhaps of all time. Rain has been pouring by up to six inches a day. And then you had the problem of an immense amount of rain. 
you suddenly had almost monsoon type rain and the ground was so hard it couldn't take it all back. Flash floods were not the solution the nation was looking for. We needed to get the rain back into the reservoir system and the underground aquifers and things like that. So we needed an awful lot more rain. Restrictions still apply in the Thames and the Anglia areas. The Datchet Reservoir in Buckinghamshire, which supplies London, is still only two-thirds full. But throughout September, the rain kept falling and falling and falling. It became very, very wet. And we finished up with the second wettest autumn since 1727 records began. Quite remarkable. By October, the heat wave of 76 started to become a distant memory. And the shift in the weather would also mark a cultural sea change for the country. Everything was changing at the speed of light. The water authorities say they've learnt their lesson. No one should run dry during the next drought. By the end of October, the great drought of 1976 was officially over. It was hugely disappointing. I mean, I just think, no, this glorious summer. Suddenly, it just seemed to rain and rain and rain. But the big change for me was October. I saw the Sex Pistols in Birmingham, and I remember the misery of the weather standing outside, waiting to get into the venue. The concert was a sellout. It attracted those who believe that punk rock is all about safety pin jewelry, the just plain curious, and the costume wearers seeking some publicity of their own. So when the Sex Pistols came on, they came on with a lot of attitude and a lot of energy. And the only way you could explain it was they showed us utter contempt. All they got was a bare chest, a lot of beer swigging, a few four-letter words from Johnny Rotten, and lyrics that might or might not have been objectionable. The Pistols was all about alienation. And we just stood and watched and thought, we like this. I suppose it's possible with the birth of punk that Maybe the heat did play a part of it. But of course, Britain wasn't particularly happy at that time, I don't think. Uh, industrial unrest, all kinds of problems. When you get a dramatic change in established weather patterns, the economy takes a very serious hit. By winter 1976, energy bills were soaring and inflation was at 16%. It's silly, you know, you've got your rent going up. You're putting the milk up for me, kids. You just can't carry on. The cost of living was spiralling out of control. These potatoes cost 95 pence a pound. Would you pay that price, then? I can't afford to. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the people who, who might buy them? I think they're not cases. While jobs and wages lagged far behind. What, 5%? No good to nobody, is it? Do you think you can win this strike? Yes, I do. As the stormy autumn ushered in waves of discontent, memories of that record-breaking summer were very different to how they would be today. It may well have been the first really conspicuous evidence of a global warming trend in the mid-70s, 75, 76, but nobody talked about it. We didn't worry about it. If there were to be a long, hot summer now, it would be completely different, because instead of being incredulous and joyful. Oh, please, let it carry on, let it carry on. People will be talking about global warming, the planet, blaming ourselves, blaming each other. And I don't think there'd be the opportunity to celebrate and just feel as if you were experiencing something wonderful, which is how it felt to us then. It felt magical. Today is going to be hot and sunny, with temperatures up to 33 degrees. Over the last 20 years, Britain has suffered a series of scorching summers, such as those of 2003. Across much of Britain, the heat is on. In 2006, drought orders were back for a heat wave that affected the whole of Europe. Britain is not used to sun as strong as this. Our most recent drought was in 2018, where parts of the country went without rain for 50 days. The grass in Hyde Park has turned to straw. 
These have made us all aware that global warming is on the rise. But since 1976, the country has never had to return to widespread standpipes and water rationing. Over the last 40 years, governments have continuously invested in desalination plants, improved reservoirs, and new main systems to transfer water in bulk to affected areas. I think Britain now is probably much better equipped to deal with a, a heat wave and a drought like that. You know, nobody had a, even an ice tray back in 1976, but it would still be an issue if it didn't rain for that length of time. It's pretty unusual for this country. Whether or not we ever see a summer like it again, for those who experienced it, 1976 will forever remain halcyon. The summer of 76 was the greatest summer of my life. My career began. I discovered a form of music that just built my future, and I loved it. It was fabulous. Not that I'm hoping for global warming, but I do love it when we have a really hot summer. And I wouldn't mind if another summer like 76 came round again. The long, hot summer of 76, the best year ever, the best summer of my life, a kind of epic, beautiful, unusual, unfathomable, inexplicably brilliant time. And we have never seen its like again. Now, if you or a friend or family have had a holiday blighted by Britain's airport crisis, we'll investigate how not to get caught out. Brand new on Thursday night at 8. Next tonight, the tunes that had us doing the standpipe shuffle as we queued for water in 76. Britain's biggest 70s hits in just a moment.